So this is the normal test and optimally damp system is what we call normal. Um, when the fast flush okay, is of the continuous flush system is activated so when you press you you see this thing going up okay it will create that sharp upstroke and terminates in a flat line at the maximal indicator of as the, at, at the maximal indicator on the monitor I should say and this is followed by an in, immediate and rapid downstroke rapid downstroke right extending below the baseline so this is your baseline so it went down extending below the baseline with just one or two oscillation one or two oscillation hold on guys let me erase it so that you guys can see it so again the normal square wave test or what we call optimally damp system is when the fa uh, fast flush <laughs> fast flush of the continuous flush system is activated that means you pressed it and there's now you know no more saline going into the system it will it will and you quickly released it it will create this upstroke sharp upstroke and it terminates in a flat line at the maximal indicator on the monitor and this is followed by an immediate and rapid downstroke extending below the baseline uh, with just one or two oscillation so one two all right and within point 12 seconds so it's not too you know too long and a quick return to the baseline so one two oscillation 12 seconds and it went back to the baseline so this is your dichrotic notch okay so your art line art arterial waveform with dichrotic notch is normal and you went an upstroke flat line and then it releases below the baseline one to two oscillation normal test look at your over damp where is your oscillate um, dichrotic notch here so your arterial waveform is now I mean if this is your I your dichrotic notch is too low right so over damp and you do not have the oscillation as I mentioned a while ago there's an downward stroke right there is that immediate and rapid downstroke downstroke like this supposed to be go below the baseline like this so you did not have that so you're over damp so what are the reason why you have an over damp and what will be the effect to your hemodynamics so number one is it will give you a falsely low systolic pressure and a falsely high diastolic pressure so low systolic low systolic blood pressure high diastolic blood pressure so that's not good in your art line okay so it will also um, and I, I mentioned a while ago you don't have a dichrotic not sure how can you fix this well check your line so check for the presence of any blood clots because you just use it for blood draw right so there might be a blood left in the catheter so flush that um, you know aspirate it if you want and check for air bubbles so you, you might have some air bubbles at any point from the catheter so it's just probably sitting into the transducer um, flush it so you can flush it out open open to air right just flush it out and use a shorter monitoring tubing so um, especially if they're coming from OR oh my god they're like coiling the tubing like you don't need it you get rid of it okay the shorter the tubing the most more, more accurate it is because it just gonna give you the real pressure here into the monitor okay 
Um, under damp. Look at this, guys. So you have an under damp here. Why? The waveform is characterized by numerous amplified oscillation. So above and below the baseline. So one, two, three, four. So above and below the baseline. Okay. So this is above the baseline. These are below the baseline. So again, we talk about one to two. We did not point twelve seconds, right? Point twelve seconds. Oh God, I cannot even write seconds. And here it's more than that. And there's so many like oscillation. So you are now under damp. So look, we only need one there, and you have three here. So there is a false high systolic. Okay, so this is false high systolic blood pressure. And there will be a falsely low diastolic blood pressure. So again, guys, under damp, high systolic blood pressure, but it's falsely uh, low diastolic blood pressure. Falsely low diastolic pressure. And the ringing artifacts on. These are your ringing artifacts on the waveform. How are you going to correct this? So remove all air bubbles in the fluid system. Um, sometimes they said use a larger bore, but it's not us to say, right? It's a doctor. It's an anesthesiologist. But what you can do is shorten your tubings. If it's too long, you can shorten it. All right. So if you have any question with this, again, guys, I highly recommend get an um, get a AACN book, Critical Care, Core Competency, and then you can see it over there. You can find it there. So again, this zeroing is the act of electronically compensating for any offset distortion to make it more accurate. So your data will be more accurate. Okay, and this is normally done by exposing the transducer to air. That's why we oh, close to patient, open to air, and then zero the monitor, and then you'll see a zero. Okay, so this step is performed at least once before the beginning of your shift for hemodynamic reading. Okay. All right. So now it's we're moving on to another concept. So this is what we say your PA catheter, and the tip is normally into the PA art pulmonary artery, right? So now you are measuring the pressure in the lungs. So that's your PA pulmonary artery pressure. You have systolic and diastolic. And you're measuring what we call pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or PAOP. Okay, PAOP. And that reflects your left, <laughs> this is left atrial pressure. All right, and then um, your CBP is on the proximal port. So this is where blue. So proximal and distal. So this distal is yellow, proximal is blue. So proximal is for your IV fluids. Sorry guys. So you can use that for your IV fluids, drawing blood for laboratory um, and medication. Proximal or distal, the PA is the yellow. Distal is somewhere here, somewhere here. Okay, so there's a, you can only use the distal, oh, I'm so sorry, distal, yeah, distal is far, I always say distal, you're, you're too distant with me, so you're far, right, proximal, you're so close, so the distal area is, because I saw the infusion line, we don't infuse anything, guys, nah, you do not use this for any kind of infusion, we're not allowed but we can draw a mixed venous here so if they say can you draw an svo2 so mixed venous it's here on the yellow port okay and then flush it out and uh, connect it to your monitor or don't well there's always this thing that you you can always like a vamp and you draw blood from there right and then you close it after 
to the monitor you know you close it so that it will continuously monitor so please if you are at the bedside clarify it with your preceptor but definitely this is something that I'm gonna ask you if they say can you get me a SVO2 get it from the distal port the yellow port the blue port is your proximal port that's all your blood draw for chemistry hemoglobin hematocrit like that blood uh, transfusion fluid boluses medication so a lot of nurses will put a manifold so that you know again depending on the compatibility guys check the compatibility okay for your medication and when you think about your pulmonary circulation is different from your systemic circulation okay well this is mostly the systemic the red one is the systemic circulation the blue one is your uh, venous area right arterial area is the red venous area is the blue however this is the start of your pulmonary circulate pulmonary circulation as soon as that eight uh, pulmonic valve opens it will end here before the left atrium so what's in here you have your pulmonary artery pressure right which include your systolic and your diastolic and also your mean okay so the normal values as far as I can remember 25 some books said to 30 over 8 to 15 right and then your mean is normally 16 millimeters per mercury okay 16 all right my pen is not good all right guys so over here um so now we say that if you wedge okay so if the balloon is here you will then have your paop so the wedge is 8 to 12. so you have an 8 to 12 normal values for your wedge all right so therefore if you're thinking about your pulmonary vascular resistance you would then your pulmonary artery mean minus paop right paop okay i'm gonna go here so pulmonary vascular resistance is pa mean minus paop okay divided by your cardiac output okay and you multiply by 80 that is your pulmonary vascular resistance how much of a resistance in the pulmonary vasculator okay because sometimes if you have a PE here, let's say you have a pulmonary embolism here, that pressure builds up. Your PAP will go up. Pulmonary hypertension, for example, and that will create a higher PAP. Diastolic and systolic, systolic and diastolic. Okay, So that's the reason why we're measuring pulmonary vascular resistance. Because if your pulmonary vascular resistance, you would... You'd, you're going to give this patient some medication. They're constricting in there, so you need to dilate them. And some of the pulmonary vascular um, dilator usually are Flolan and Viagra. Yeah. So we give them Flolan, Flolan, okay, Flolan, and Viagra. So in the old days, we give Flolan with ice. We sandwich it with ice and we hang it. There's certain temperature that they require, the pharmacy will tell you. Uh, however, nowadays I've seen RT, respiratory therapist, putting it into their ventilator. But the Viagra, you can give them by mouth. If they have an NG, then you can crush it and give it, okay? Make sure that your patient gets it because it's really a good 
pulmonary vascular dilator. All right, what about systemic? So the, the systemic system is the left atrial, left ventricle, then it comes out to the aorta, right? Aortic valve. So now you have a mean arterial pressure here. So your mean arterial pressure is your systolic minus double of your diastolic divided by three, right? And then of course that gives you um, hopefully more than 65 because in the ICU they, this is the magic number, right? More than 65. Because if you have that mean arterial pressure in this peripheral vasculator, right? This area here, you have arterioles here. The peripheral arterioles are so sensitive, they are very good in constricting because there is an alpha one in there, right? So alpha one, alpha one, and then the only thing the only place where there is no alpha one, but instead it's a beta beta two smooth muscle is the musculoskeletal area. So once there is this what we call pressure that we need to overcome, okay, so about 25 millimeters of pressure to overcome into the uh, to the capillary network, right? And then it goes to the organ, like for example, liver, uh, splenic, your liver, your spleen, your GI, and then there's one in ki uh, going to your renal, and it's the renal is a little bit more higher, like 30 millimeters per mercury pressure, so that you can, why? It is because you have two um, arteries there, the afferent and afferent and efferent. So then it goes into the venules, right? So the veins is a little bit more, kind of less pressure compared to the arterial so this is a mo um, usually like 10 millimeters per mercury pressure okay and then when you think about your cbp here we want it zero so that there's no gradient zero gradient meaning the pressure is so you know low that the you know that even this 10 millimeters of mercury pressure can push this blood or venous return to the right side of the heart so some of the books, the CBP is normally 0 to 2, but of course we don't want that because they're critically ill in the ICU. We, they adjusted it in either 2 to 6, but if they're septic, 6 to 12, right? Sepsis protocol. So then, systemic vascular resistance is equal to mean arterial pressure minus your CBP you divide it by cardiac output and times 80, right? So um, when you think about it, this is higher pressure, this is lower pressure. So that is the difference between your pulmonary vascular resistance, systemic vascular resistance. Again, guys, this number or this uh, terms here, they are considered after load after the heart because the right ventricle it goes out right to the lungs so outside the heart that is your peripheral vascular resistance systemic vascular resistance is outside the left ventricle before going into the right side all right so again guys your lungs your pulmonary vein so for your aorta here pressure you have some mean arterial pressure there that's what we say um, then the liver needs blood via hepatic artery there's a hepatic portal vein so the liver is getting two side uh, two routes of blood supply from the hepatic artery and from the hepatic or portal vein so this is your gut let's say this is your stomach and there is a, a portal artery there that goes into the liver and at the same time there is also a hepatic 
artery so twice right and then of course the renal artery your kidneys and then your lower body so then goes back into the renal vein and this is your cable system your inferior vena cava and your superior vena cava right inferior and superior vena cava and that is going to be the distribution into the systemic circulation back to the right side into the lungs okay so again guys this is a review the doctors put in a pa catheter right atrium this is your cbp right two to eight see there's bo different books will give you a different number but definitely let's just say this is a critical care book so they want it two to eight then pa cat pa pulmonary artery pressure systolic 20 to 30 0 to 5 so again guys it's different but again i'm telling you this is the core curriculum for the, from the aacn so let's just follow this 20 to 30 systolic 0 to 5 diastolic so here 0 probably to 5 in there and and then of course your dichrotic notch oh this is your right ventricle i'm so sorry right ventricle i'm talking about right ventricle 20 to 30 0 to 5. so now this is your pap pa pulmonary artery pressure so 20 to 30 right 10 to 15. so it's close all right so dichrotic notch here you will see dichrotic notch and then your wedge 8 to 12. 2 to 8 cbp 20 to 30 20 or 20 to 30 over 10 to 15 pap 8 to 12 uh, wedge so if you have a patient on mechanical ventilation and you have a catheter pa catheter and you will wedge you will only get again mechanical ventilation during exhalation which is the valley okay valley so i always remember v and v valley if the patient is a spontaneous breathing so patient okay you go for a pick so pick after exhalation so exhalation so whatever is the peak so p p p p p for patient p for peak ventilation v for ventilation v for valley so this is the part of your PA catheter when you do a cardiac output. Cardiac output is a different pro um, maneuver or procedure that you do in order for you to be able to see how much going in or how much blood going in and out in one minute, right? And you need your cable, thermostar, so this is your temperature probe. You need the syringe, a special syringe like 10 cc or 10 ml syringe. Some hospitals would use eye saline or you can just use a regular saline bag here. Okay, so they put ice there. They soak the tubings in there so that it will cool, and whatever you're aspirating here will be a cool saline or cold saline. And then you have this term temperature probe that is attached over here see there's a temperature probe in there thermistor so if I flush the blood here so the blood from the right ventricle will go to the pulmonary artery right and how soon it will how soon it will leave the system so this is the thermistor sensing the cold saline that you just flush here and it gives you a bell curve Okay, so you need a three bell curve that you do and then you pick the perfect bell curve and then that would be your cardiac output. So three attempts and the monitor will tell you ready to inject. 
and then you inject it fast so that you will create a bell sh shape okay a bell curve all right so that is just your pa catheter so now we're going to go to the normal blood pressure so blood pressure is part of hemodynamics monitoring right so when you think about your normal blood pressure we always say well we don't want our patients to have hypertension or malignant hypertension so but the blood pressure is solely dependent dependent on your cardiac output times your total peripheral resistance or resistance okay bp so that means you you use that um concept of if your total peripheral resistance are constricted so let's just say this is your left heart right and this is your aorta and into the peripheral cir systemic circulation as i mentioned a while ago you have all these arterioles here and they're constricting right they can constrict really well and they're going to give you a higher pressure that your left ventricle needs to you know push this the blood out of the system and that can that can actually demonstrate us blood pressure that's why it's pressure so look here on the left atrium your pressure is about zero when they go to the left ventricle there is that 120 pressure in there it's building up so that it has more energy to pump that blood out into the aorta right so when you're pushing blood out of the aorta you still have the same pressure 120 and once they come out to the large arteries there is this pressure that's a little bit higher than 120 and then they go to the small arteries then the pressure is dropping and once they get to the arterioles I told you there's about 25 millimeters of pressure there so they will be dropped more um, so there's gonna be in the 60 40 and then 20 right and then they pass the arterioles they go to the capillary network and then into the vein it will go down to slightly above zero go back to the right atrium it's almost like less than between two to four or two to six right and then to the right ventricle there's another pressure in there that gives you that 20 to 25 or 30 here and then to the pulmonary arteries again it's a little below the 40 and then to the arterioles inside the lungs capillary pulmonary capillary network to the venous pulmonary vein so this is your normal blood pressure the higher pressure is normally in the circulatory area systemic circulation i should say systemic circulation okay so what do you do when your patient have a high blood pressure you give them a basal dye later right either venous or arterial so some definition, cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the ventricle each minute. You hear that a lot in the training. And cardiac output is so dependent uh, with heart rate and stroke volume. So heart rate, again, I would consider thinking about how fast is your heart rate. Because if it's too low, too slow, not good. Too fast, not good either. What if they have irregular, like 101, then it goes to 90, and then it goes to 140, you know? So which number are you going to get? So this is something that I always um, look at the median. <laughs> so if you have a very erratic blood, you know, heart rate, the heart rate is all over the place, then that's something that you probably will get a series of numbers and get the median. Okay, before you run or else if you're gonna plug in 140 it's gonna give you a very high number right same way when you plug in 40 it's gonna give you a very low number so please 
and the stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected by the ventricle with each contraction. So what makes it con uh, what is this means to you? So we say the end diastolic volume is if you're filling in a bucket. So diastolic means filling. And at the end of filling time, how much in the bucket? Or when I say bucket, ventricle. So the right ventricle and the left ventricle, right? So let's just say there is a 120 ml of blood at the end of the diastolic volume. And then the heart will squeeze, right? Systole. So when I squeeze, when the heart, left ventricle, right ventricle, squeeze the systole so end systolic volume how much left let's just say 50 left 50 ml so 120 minus 50 is pretty much your 70 ml is your stroke volume okay this is your stroke volume so therefore stroke volume equals end diastolic blood and diastolic volume minus and systolic volume okay is equals to stroke volume so again guys cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume and how do you get your stroke volume and diastolic volume minus and systolic volume sometimes if they did an echo you see the report in the echo look for these two eb and diastolic volume and n systolic then you can compute your stroke volume you can also compute your ef ejection fraction how so your ejection fraction is equivalent to stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume so a while ago it was 70 right you divide by 120 so 70 divided by 120 I have my calculator here 70 divided by 120 is 0.58 so you have an um, ejection fraction of 58 percent which is good right that's how you get it okay we're moving on cardiac index um, it's the difference in body size so in the ICU we use cardiac index a lot um, why because the doctor wants to know more the cardiac index and also the cardiac output but it gives them an idea so when I think about cardiac index I always think of tissue perfusion so tissue perfusion right um, and then there's another stroke volume in there okay we talk about the ejection fraction is the percentage of blood in the ventricle that is ejected again after load is that pressure against which the ventricle must pump so outside your arterial tone are you constricted your systemic vascular resistance that is your afterload so I want you guys to think right side after load okay is what and your left side after load is what okay so we're talking about after load PVR here pulmonary vascular resistance left side after load SVR okay systemic vascular resistance so we discuss pulmonary vascular resistance as your pulmonary artery mean minus your wedge okay and you divide by cardiac output multiplied by 80 I did not make this up guys the 80 is constant and systemic or systemic vascular resistance is your mean arterial pressure you minus it by CBP you divide by cardiac output multiply by 80 so the normal is 800 to some books 1100 some books 1200 PVR 150 
to 250. So anything above above the normal, if you're too high, you're too tight. Very tight. What do you need to give them? Baso dilator, right? You need to treat them with baso dilator. Okay, management. If you're too low, too loose, right? Because you are really dilated there. What is you gonna give them? Baso constrictor. Okay, you give them baso constrictors, and we're gonna discuss that later. Baso constrictors. So pardon my pen. All right, and then your preload. So your preload, the right side is CBP, the left side is PAOP. The right side is CBP, central venous pressure. The left side preload is pulmonary artery occlusive pressure. Again, you say, well, man, we don't do PAO wedge in my hospital. Use your pulmonary artery diastolic. Remember that 30 over 15? Normally, they say that you're a little lower, um, three points or two points lower. So your PAOP is, as I mentioned, 8 to 12. Okay. Uh, if they equalize between PAD and PAOP, we always say, do you have a tamponade? Well, if they are overly or overwhelmingly high let's say 60 over 45 right and then when you wedge it's like 40 wow that's really high almost equalizes or 44 something like that so then you would say hey they're so close together because normally wedge don't go that high right so and I'm, I'm hoping that pulmonary artery diastolic don't go this high either because <laughs> that's really high that's a lot of pulmonary hypertension there and then your contractility is your cardiac output cardiac index right some hospitals are using the right ventricle stroke work index or left ventricle stroke stroke work index so that's what they're using for contractility. And you have some medication for contractility meds like your milrinone, dobutrex, or dobutamine, right? Or balloon pump. So again, guys, this is what we just talked about. Your diastolic filling, how much blood went in. And remember, who is responsible for giving you time to fill uh, for atria to contract and for the ventricle to fill is your AV node, right? Your AV node will be a very specialized low conducting myocardial cell and what does it do is it will take about 0.10 seconds, right? For the impulse to pass and by the 0.10 seconds this atria will con completely contracted and blood will flows or flow into the ventricle again what happened if you have a dilated ventricle so it will affect contractility what happened if you have a hypertrophic ventricle you have an inlet size issue right so it's still gonna con affect your cardiac output so you should not have all this issue and you will be normal but we don't see that in the ICU, right? Because most of our patients are either chronically ill or complex cases. So that's a problem. And the fiber stretch is what we call the Frank Starling Law. Frank Frank Starling Law. The Frank Starling Law is if you have a brand new rubber band, you will stretch it and it goes back, right? Same. Uh, original position so therefore the analogy of Frank Starling law what is that Manny well Frank is like 
Frank Starling. Okay, law. So that means you don't. You you have to challenge the ventricle. Give them more fluids. The more you expand them, the stronger it will contract. Okay, and that will actually give you a good cardiac output. So if you don't have a very um, good cardiac output, what's gonna happen is the ventricle will either shrink or dilate. Okay, and if that di if they dilate because of low cardiac output that's not good so that's why we always want them to uh, give them fluids fluids right so that is the contractility here so if your contractility is weak it will affect your stroke volume if your preload is low or high it will affect your stroke volume your afterload is again the vent, um, I just mentioned your ventricle size, hypertrophy, or dilated wall thickness, and the pressure. Because what if I have an aortic valve stenosis here? And of course, you know the the ventricle will work hard to pass that pressure and open that valve, and eventually your ventricle, left ventricle, will get muscular. Okay so that's another problem of afterload and if the periphery total um, peripheral vase uh, arterioles are constricted then you might end up dealing with pressure again that's your afterload so think about this guys this is your analogy so your heart is the donkey right so you have a donkey here trying to climb the hill and how young is the donkey or how healthy is the donkey is another concept to think about meaning if your heart is not healthy I might have some issues with contractility right but if I don't have any issue I can contract of course you have a good heart you have you're, you're strong so what about if your preload is too much let's say this donkey is going to be carrying a tons of heavy loads and it's gonna carry these loads up in the hill up to the hill right so do you think um the donkey can do that probably he can if he's young right so that's really affecting your preload okay so this is the altitude or the level of the incline level is your after load okay so that is your after load let's say you increase the after load and so this is the donkey trying to climb with his heavy loads do you think it's possible he'll probably exert a lot of effort there and eventually he'll gonna get tired okay so this is your afterload here same analogy if he is a little hold on let's say you gave him little um, amount of load right and the incline is not even very high, steep so this is your afterload and this is the donkey okay he's just only carrying about 80 pounds but you made him back go up and down the hill 150 times right do you think that's gonna it's doable for the donkey or the donkey will even collapse pass out right uh, if that is the speed or how many times you he went up and down the hill so again guys that's the kind of analogy that I want you guys to think about when you're thinking about your preload and your afterload and contractility the healthiness of your heart the heaviness of your preload the 
the amount of like speed of your preload requires how how hard is your afterload your pressure in there or you know things like that like to overcome so that you can pass pass that afterload so what are things to increase right atrial pressure because we say two CVP is two to six if you have a pulmonary hypertension backflow right if you have a pulmonary embolism backflow if you have constricted pericarditis the healthiness of the heart okay so the right atria might not you know the left side of the heart is not contracting really well then of course backflow cardiac tamponade okay it's backflow and so when cardiac tamponade is like this guys this is your heart in the middle and if it's strangulated unable to squeeze or contract and relax that is um, compromising the healthiness of the heart it's now asking you for tamponade because you can get tamponade even if it's only like 100 ml but you can have fluids uh, like cardiac effusion as long uh, with 200 right cardiac effusion with 300 ml but still your heart can able to contract and relax it's not a cardiac tamponade so we only define cardiac tamponade when the normal function of the heart altered the relaxation and contraction get disturbed then of course right heart failure pulmonary stenosis, COPD, obstructive sleep apnea, right ventricular infarction can actually increase your CBP. How do you decrease that? High, oh, if the number is low, possible causes of a decreased CBP or low CBP, hypobulimia, too much diuretics, you're losing blood because of GI bleeding, you got burned, you know, you were vomiting for a while and diarrhea for a while. Or you just got vasodilator medication like nitrates, morphine, or some allergic reaction. Okay. What about right ventricle? So in the right ventricle, you have pressure in there we discussed between 15 to 30 and diastolic is 2 to 6 what if your number is high backflow again pulmonary hypertension left-sided heart failure backflow the uh, ventricular septal defect okay infarction ischemia on the left ventricle uh, mitral regurgitation it doesn't close stenosis it's hard to open cardiomyopathy so cardiomyopathy is either restrictive, hypertrophic, or dilated. And then pulmonary disease such as COPD and PE or hypoxemia. So that these are the conditions that can increase your right ventricular pressure. Okay. So some pulmonary hypertension here, sleep obstructive sleep apnea, Eisenmenger, I don't know this and right to left shunt cyanosis so this creates your right ventricle to go up and of course the left ventricle to go down if you're whatever we discuss in cbp will be the same dilate um receiving a lot of vasodilation vomiting bleeding those kind of things what about your pulmonary artery pressure? So systolic is 20 to 30, diastolic is 5 to 10, your mean is 10 to 20. So it goes up, it will go up your pulmonary artery pressure, normally pulmonary hypertension, PE, any kind of atrial or ventricular septal defect, those are congenital, right? There is a right to left or left to right shunt. Hypertension, pulmonary hypertension or just the hypertension, emboli, COPD, left, vent uh, left ventricular failure, so that's a backflow, mitral stenosis or regurgitation, you have a fluid overload, you have ischemia. So 
these things can actually cre create pulmonary artery pressure to go up okay <clears throat> so again this is just a simple analogy that we can only check cardiac output cardiac index by using PA catheter right so you inject fluids here it will come out here on the CBP and then it will measure by the catheter here and then it gives you a number so cardiac output is a stroke volume times heart rate and the normal is 4 to 8 4 to 8 imagine if you have 4 liters or 8 liters of blood think about what it can do to your body tissue perfusion okay so um, there are certain situations that even if you have a 4 or 8 liters of blood coming out if you have a hypermetabolic state like very very you know this kind of things um, thiamine deficiency if you have some sarcoidosis you know any kind of issue that increases metabolic and this won't be enough to perfuse the tissue um, same way with your cardiac index cardiac output divided by BSA body surface area times 1000 so this is what I normally remember is your cardiac index 2.5 is your number and above to always know if my cardiac index is 2.3 below it will alert me to look for more signs of tissue perfusion like urine output altered mental state uh, dropping of autosat those kind of things early early sign restlessness you know confusion and bef because if you neglect to see that mm, it will eventually drop everything and when you reach a cardiac index of like 2 and below cardiac index 2 and below is going to tell you tissue perfusion so um, alteration in tissue perfusion so that gives you probably an oligoric state al altered mental state hypotensive state you know so if you are that nurse who who's seeing that and not what I mentioned before that um, then you need to practice some more because you need to anticipate right so that's what we call anticipation critical thinking so we talk about your MAP so some hospitals want 65 they're happy but this one is he wants you to have 70 to 105 and then your CVP or right atrial pressure is 2 to 8 this is your pulmonary artery pressure 8 to 12 pulmonary artery systolic 15 to 35 so there's a variability of numbers and your PA diastolic 10 to 15 pulmonary vascular resistance again here guys is 100 to 250 this is from AACN book um, then your pulmonary artery mean is 15 to 20 okay let's move on to systemic so we discussed systemic vascular resistance a while ago which is your mean arterial pressure minus your CBP multiply divide by cardiac output then you multiply by 80 it's the same 800 to 1200 is the normal range um, okay and then your SVRI index again is it all depends on your cardiac index not your cardiac output okay all right so any medication that the doctor will order you should understand that because we are an additional layer of protection if for example your CVP is really high and you know that if it's high you need some reducer right you need to reduce that CVP so medication that we normally give is Lasix so 20 milligrams or higher so 
and onset is less than five minutes yeah I should be peeing after six or seven minutes I should give you more than 500 of urine right if it's not then you can go go out call the doctor and say hey doc I just gave 20 I think he needs some more because he did not pee a lot because your goal is to reduce the volume however if my blood pressure is low let the doctor know because you cannot be giving me Lasix so that's probably another thing to think about right so the Lasix if it didn't work sometimes Bumex so Bumex is 0.5 to 10 it's either an IV or PO okay it's 0.5 to 10 milligrams a day and the onset is less than five minutes diarrheal 500 to 2000 onset is one to two hours either IV or PO Adecrine or etrocinic acid 50 to 100 less than five minutes also so your Lasix is really good less than five minutes it should kick in right away right your seroxylin and your mannitol they're there so what about your vasodilating agent so vasodilation they can still reduce preload and this is your dopamine so the only thing I don't like about dopamine is it can increase your heart rate okay so watch out for heart rate um, the onset is five minutes it's only IV it's um, extra visation so it needs to go to central line nitroglycerin our favorite you can start by five mics to 400 mics one to two minutes they started to dilate um, they are base venous vasodilation so what they do is your vein they will dilate and the fluids will stay there you won't you won't get rid of fluids you're just dilating the veins so that they can accommodate for more fluids there so that means if you need your fluids then eventually just gonna go to the right side of the heart unless the Lasix you really need to get rid of the fluids so again guys I would probably do nitro if my blood pressure is not allowing me you know this is low blood pressure especially heart failure patient you know they already have that negative feedback loop so if they're having low blood pressure and yet you need volume right because you can't really get rid of volume so nitro arterial venous vasodilator you dilate the vein you keep the fluids in there upload the right side of the heart upload the pressure into the right side because they're just sitting in here but you're not getting rid of the fluids your tank will remain the same nitroprusside is a uh, afterload reducing agent so we give nipride for our hypertensive patient uh, there is clebidipine now that they added you know it I think it's like um, in the old days I still remember your cardine so now clebidipine <laughs> so you have your nitroglycerin again in there it can be an afterload reducer also so your nitro it's it's working like a wonder drug right so it can be a preload reducer afterload reducer hydralazine is an afterload reducer uh, it can act 10 to 20 minutes right away your regitin is less than one minute it's an afterload reducer so these are the medication that you should understand so this is something where your critical thinking will be come to play because the doctor will put in these orders and if you don't god if you don't question those orders how can you advocate for your patient right well I don't understand man I'm just waiting for the doctor well that's not a good nursing you know I see you nursing I want you to proactively we call it role base not task base <laughs> what is that Manny well they said that role based nursing is like what we call professional nursing versus task that you just come to work to empty Foley right so you don't want this you want this you advocate for your patient and say hey do you really want 
happy net frame for after load reducer when you can just have nitro because it's preload and after load reducer so if you don't know what you're treating might as well just give him both right so that's what I do and then of course your smooth muscle relaxants and alpha inhibitors are your um, angiotensin converting enzymes your capotin ACE right um, your captopril is if, especially if this is the first time that the patient receives it be very careful because they might get an angioedema angioedema not good All right lisinopril is ARB um, they're better friendlier they won't cause angioedema and I think that's it guys I thank you for listening and if you have any question let me know